Welcome back to JT Ministries. Today, Pastor Gary bring us another Bible study on the book of 1 Corinthians. I hope you enjoy it, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. We have a free PDF Bible for download down in the description. Thank you for tuning in. Now, here is Pastor Gary. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Good to see you here tonight. Let's turn in our Bibles there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me give you just a brief a brief little overview of where we've been up to this point. We've spent several weeks in chapter 12 because this is a, uh, a section uh, between chapters 12, 13, and 14 about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that Paul is giving instruction to the Corinthian church about. They have apparently misused the gifts of the Spirit. They are somewhat immature in their walk with Christ. And so Paul is correcting them about a few things. And among the things he corrects them is concerning the proper use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the proper function of the gifts of the Spirit within the church. So that's kind of been our theme the last couple of weeks, and including tonight, the gifts of the Spirit and their proper use in the church. And as I've mentioned over the last few weeks, depending on how some people count them, and you will read different things that different Bible scholars will write as they kind of enumerate the different gifts of the Spirit, but there are roughly 20 gifts of the Spirit. Thirteen of those gifts are here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then there are another seven gifts that are mentioned we will also touch on before the end of the Bible study tonight, just briefly. Uh, But so far, we've been looking at nine of the gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've talked about, and I'm just going to go through the list, read the definitions. If you want all the commentary, you can go back to the previous teachings and pull up the archives on the, on the teaching library on our website. But first of all, we talked about the message or the word of wisdom, which is an inspired insider answer to a problem or question. We talked also about the message or word of knowledge, which is inspired information about a matter or a person. We talked about the gift of faith which is a special ability to trust and rest in the promises or possibilities of God for a given situation. And then moving down the list, we talked about the gift of healing, the supernatural ability of God working through a person to cure illnesses or restore health apart from natural means. We talked about the gift of miraculous powers, which is the working of God's power through a person for his glory. We also talked about the gift of prophecy, which is to declare or speak something under divine inspiration for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort of people. And it may be either foretelling or forthtelling in its basic definition. We also mentioned the distinguishing or the discerning of spirits. This is to discern between what is divine, human, or evil about a person or a situation. And then last week, uh, we, we finished out the first nine of the 13 gifts. Uh, And we talked about tongues, which is an inspired language unknown to the person speaking for prayer and praise to God. And we also talked about the interpretation of tongues, which is the companion gift to tongues for the purpose of edifying the speaker or hearers. Now, these are all gifts that God gives as he determines through the body of Christ. We talked about why does he do that? Two reasons, for the glorification of God and for the edification of the church. In their proper use, the gifts of the Spirit bring glory to God and edify or build up one another in the local church. But they are to be used properly. There is an order. God is a God of order. He is not a God of chaos or confusion. There is a right order for the gifts to be exercised. There's a right place for them to be exercised or not to be exercised. This doesn't mean that God is rigid. It means that God is a God of order. He is a God of simplicity. He is a God who wants things to be done decently and in order. And so the gifts of the Spirit are not to just be something that expresses that express themselves in this kind of haphazard or ecstatic, you know, um, approach. But they are to be exercised in the proper place, proper way, proper time. Everything is to be done in an orderly and a decent manner. And so we made it through the first nine gifts of the Spirit. And tonight we're going to look through the rest of chapter 12, hopefully even into chapter 13. And by the time we get to the end of chapter 12, we're going to see he he mentions eight gifts of the Spirit, four of which are new when you compare the eight to the first nine we've already read. We come up with four that are new, so we'll be talking about that as well. But first we've got a major section of chapter 12 to get through. So let's pause and have a word of prayer, and then we'll start here in chapter 12 at verse 12. But let's first have a word of prayer. 
Father, as we come before you tonight now, we just ask for you to give us a heart that would receive what you would say to us. We thank you for your word, the Bible. We, I thank you, Lord, for all those who are here tonight and those who are watching online. We just want all of it to bring you glory, Lord, that you'd be glorified in every way. Strengthen our hearts. Lord, we live in a world where it often takes a toll on us uh, between the world and our own flesh and Satan. We, we just feel like sometimes we're fighting conflict on three different fronts constantly. So, Lord, encourage us tonight, strengthen us, and just fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, we pray. And we give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. And everyone said, Amen. So I'm going to start here in verse 12. I'm going to read down through verse 26, and then we'll come back and comment on it. Verse 12 says, The body is a unit... Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now, he's using figurative language here. Um, He's talking about being baptized. We come together. He's talking about the spirit to drink. We're being immersed in the one and the same spirit, though he says there are a variety, different gifts within the one body. Verse 14, he says, Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. And if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Okay, so your attention for a moment before we read the last section of this chapter. Here's what Paul is saying. He gets through listing nine gifts of the Spirit in the first 11 verses of this chapter. And these first nine are often referred to more as the miraculous sign gifts. We're going to get into some other gifts of the Spirit that don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily regarded as miraculous sign gifts. But after he gets through listing a portion of the gifts of the Spirit, he says, all right, now I want everybody to know they're different gifts, all right? But there's one body, and he compares the church like unto a physical body. And he, and he says the church is like a body and Christ is the head. Christ is always the head. He is the authority. He is at the top. He is supreme. The head is what causes everything else in a physical body to function. The rest of the body, physically speaking, is subject to the head. All right? And so, in using this analogy, he's trying to paint this picture that the church, not just the local church... But the church in general, the church of Jesus Christ, is like a body. So sometimes the church will be referred to as the body of Christ. And he's using this analogy because he wants everybody to understand that though like a physical body, there are different parts. You have a head, you have ears, you have eyes, you have hands, you have feet, you have a mouth. You have all kinds of parts of the body, yet each part is important and no one part is greater than another because every part is interdependent. So apparently the church at Corinth was having some kind of a rivalry when it comes to spiritual gifts. Because that's really what he's addressing here. Some people thought that if they had certain gifts, they were more special than other people within the church 
who didn't have those particular gifts. Again, remember, God distributes the gifts of the Spirit as He determines. So it is up to God to determine who gets what particular gifts. You will, in the course of your Christian journey, discover that every person has at least one spiritual gift, and usually more than that. And in the course of our study, you might already have determined some of the first nine. As we go through some more here at the end of the chapter, you might see some others. And then I'm going to mention some from Romans and Ephesians. So you might, before tonight's service over, you'll recognize perhaps a, a gift or two or three that you have. But apparently what's going on here in the church of Corinth is so typical in any, wherever you have people who get together, most people, whether it's subconsciously or intentionally, try to one-up somebody else. Have you ever notice that? You can have a conversation, you can be at a dinner party and somebody would say to you, oh man, I, I, I might need shoulder surgery, it's, it's really killing me, I don't, I don't know. And then somebody says to you, yeah, well I need two knee replacements and I'll throw in a hip to go. And I'm just like, why does everybody have to one up just when you're talking? And so that's, that's even what happens in spiritual circles. So apparently some people were going around saying, well, I have this gift. What do you have? Oh, whatever. I have this gift, you know. And unfortunately, it's not too unlike the church today. Because in some circles of the church, people go around touting certain gifts as more important than others. So what Paul is saying here is we all have different gifts. Not one particular gift is any more special than another. Just like not one particular part of the body is any more important than another. If we all understand that Christ is the head, then the body of Christ looks complete because we all contribute to it in different ways. That's why he says, how weird would it be if, you know, the whole body was made up of a bunch of hands? Or the whole body was made up of a bunch of eyes or a bunch of feet? That's why he says, he says, you know, though though we have... Many parts were one body. And he says if in verse 13 or verse 15, he says, If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. Because all of it is necessary and important for the complementary relationship within the body of Christ. What do I mean by that? The reason why we're all different is to complement one another. That's the way God intended the body of Christ to be. We're not not all supposed to be the same. And no one is more important than anybody else, comparatively speaking. Can you imagine, you know, listen, think about this in terms of how things function properly. Like, let me use some sports analogy. Can Can you imagine on a football field, all right, there's 11 players on offense, And if everybody was the quarterback, you couldn't get the job done. Like you have 11 quarterbacks in the huddle. Can you imagine that? And then they're all calling different plays. Who's going to receive the ball? Who's going to snap the ball? Everybody's a quarterback. Can't, not everybody can be a quarterback. Baseball, same kind of thing. There's nine players on a field. Not everybody can be the pitcher. Not everybody can be the pitcher. Somebody has to catch and field the ball. Or you can't, it it doesn't work. But yet, here's what typically happens. We kind of glamorize. We glamorize the quarterback. We glamorize the pitcher. And the same thing happens in the church. We kind of glamorize certain gifts and think other gifts are lesser. And Paul says, you know what? Those gifts you think are lesser or inferior, they're actually indispensable. Because we can't all be the same, and it is important to understand the richness in the diversity of the gifts of the Spirit within the body of Christ. If we were all the same, if we all had the same gift, then there wouldn't be a very complementary functioning church. So that's the beauty of the differences. The like, same kind of thing works in a marriage. If you, if you feel like you have married an opposite, all right? Now listen, listen to me on this. The phrase that works for friends is birds of a feather flock together. But the phrase that works for marriage is opposites attract. And the reason is because your strengths are your spouse's weaknesses, usually, and your spouse's strengths are your weaknesses. And together, guess what? You complement each other. If you two were both the same, one of you wouldn't be necessary. Now, let me just show a hands here. Little quick survey, all right? Those of you who are married, all right? This is a quick survey. 
How many of you who are married consider yourself, and this is a financial question, how many of you consider yourself spenders, not really savers? How many of you consider yourself spenders? Let me see your hands. All right. Okay, you see all the spenders. Those are the broke people. Look around right there. <laughs> now, how many of you consider yourself to be more savers than you are spenders? Let me see the savers' hands. Those are the people with all the money, but they don't want to give you any. Right there. All right. <laughs> now, here's, here's what happens sometimes. When two spenders get married, pff, you're going to end up in the poorhouse. When two savers get married... You could buy the poor house, but you won't because you don't want to spend any money. And what actually is best, and just in terms of this one category of financial stewardship, is when a spender marries a saver. All right? When a spender marries a saver, now, there's, now it's complementary, and one can kind of be a good tension for the other. So the spenders... Tell the save, and but the challenge is though, and here's and here's where I'm going to go because he's going to make this case too. Don't look at your differences as something to get bothered about. Don't look at your differences as something that could cause division. He's going to mention that because he's because the case he's going to make is there's there's richness in the differences. No one difference is better than another. Okay, but don't use your differences to cause division. And the same thing can happen in a marriage. Where two people are different, they actually complement each other. It's actually a beautiful meshing of two people who are different, but they complement each other. Okay? But don't look at your differences as somehow being weird or wrong. That's the challenge. Because, you see, just using again that illustration of marriage with savers and spenders, the spenders can tend to look at the savers and think, what? You're chintzy. You're stingy. You don't ever want to give anybody anything. Look how stingy and chintzy you are. And then the saver looks at the spender and says, if it weren't for me, we wouldn't have anything to give to anybody else. You know? And then you can judge them for being frivolous with, with money. Okay? And so there's a good tension if it's properly understood and if two people understand how they can balance each other and complement each other. That's what he's saying here in the church. So for those of you taking notes, between verses 12 and 24, what we just read, he's saying different gifts equal, however, in importance. Different gifts of the Spirit equal, however, in importance. But then the last two verses I read, verses 25 and 26, he says, don't let your differences cause divisions. Don't go around condemning someone because they may not have the gift that you have. Don't look down on somebody because they don't have what you have. Don't be envious of someone because they have what you want. God distributes liberally as he chooses. Just be thankful for the gifts God has given you and function in those particular gifts. So again, verses 25 and 26, let me read it again. He says, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Okay, so that's, that's the, the thing that he stresses here. Different parts, different gifts, great. One body, one church. Jesus is the head. We all have different parts and function beautifully. But don't let your differences cause division. Rejoice with those who rejoice Celebrate with those who celebrate. If one part is honored, rejoice with it. If one part suffers, you should hurt with that part as well. And that's the way it works too in your body. If you, if you stub your toe, your whole body hurts. And if someone in the church is hurting, you should have empathy and hurt with them. And if somebody in the body is rejoicing, you should join in their celebration. Because the church should care for one another and function together in a complementary way, not in a divisive way. And unfortunately, the gifts of the Spirit have become way too divisive in the body of Christ today. And shame on us for making the gifts of the Spirit a source of contention and division. I'm not saying necessarily here. I, I, haven't, I haven't noticed it here, but I'm just saying in general, in the body of Christ, uh, shame on us if we, if we use the gifts of the Spirit to cause any kind of division or discord uh, in the church. That's not why they were given. 
So the last part of this chapter, he says this, because we're going to see now a couple more gifts. Verse 27, he says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church of God, and, and in the church, God has appointed, first of all, and here are some of these gifts, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. All right, now that, that end section there, he's, he's just throwing out a bunch of rhetorical questions. Because he's, what he's wanting to say is, not everybody speaks in tongues, not everybody prophesies, not everybody has a gift of healing. Okay? God distributes the gifts as he determines. So don't get all worked up because... You don't have a particular gift. Just be thankful for the gifts you do have and function in those gifts and give glory to God in that way. Don't envy. Don't be jealous. Just function in the gifts that God has given you. Now, in this last section here, I rattled, rattled off eight gifts, but he's already mentioned four of those in that list. And so I'm going to mention the other four that we haven't already touched on. And those are the gifts of apostleship, uh, the gifts of teaching, the gifts of administration, and the gifts of helps. Okay, so here, so here we go. Just again, a few more definitions to add to the list. The gift of apostleship. He mentions there that God has given, first of all, apostles uh, in verse 28. The gift of apostleship is a visionary gift for planting and overseeing churches or ministries and for maintaining doctrinal integrity. Now, Paul is called an apostle, and he had an apostolic gift because his gifting was he went from town to town to town throughout Asia Minor, planting churches. But he would never stay very long because he was not called to be a pastor. He was was an apostle, and the apostle is one who has a gift of planting something, handing it off, and moving on. That is a true apostolic gift where you plant something, you get something started, you kind of maintain some doctrinal oversight, but other than that, you move on. It's kind of a vi- this visionary gift. Now, this particular gift uh, is important to understand in terms of its availability and its function today. Because, strictly speaking, we have to differentiate between the gift of apostleship and the office of apostles. Why is that important to distinguish? Because the Bible tells us that there are two strict definitions for what makes an apostle. And I raise this because you might ask, are there apostles today? And if there are apostles today, they have to qualify by two strict qualifications that Scripture teaches us. For you note-takers, the first qualification is that an apostle... By definition, talking about the office of an apostle, a person who claims to be an apostle, number one, must be an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. The Bible tells us in Acts 1, 21 and 22, Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Now they're talking about replacing Judas. And they add in Acts 1.22, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So when the apostles were trying to decide who should replace Judas, and by the way, I mentioned this last week or the week before, I'm not sure that that was their business to do, because it seems from Scripture that God just simply wanted to choose Paul, that would be later, but they feel like, well, we gotta, we got to replace Judas. And they at least understood this much, that one who is going to be called an apostle among us must be one who has been an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. It's Acts one twenty two. I just read it to you. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. When did Paul see the resurrected Jesus? Remember when he was on the road to Damascus, the Bible says, breathing out murderous threats, persecuting the church of Jesus, wanting to kill Christians... He saw 
the resurrected Lord Jesus. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. That's why Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, that he is an apostle, although one abnormally born. That's the word that he uses. That's the term he uses because he says, I didn't come conventionally by seeing the resurrected Jesus when Jesus actually rose from the dead, but I actually did see him much later when Jesus appeared to me on the road to Damascus years later. But nevertheless, he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. The other strict qualification for an apostle, according to scripture, is that of 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And it tells us that the things that mark an apostle, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, not 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the things that mark an apostle are signs, wonders, and miracles done among you with great perseverance. So, an apostle strictly speaking, must be one who has been an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ and is one who performs signs, wonders, and miracles. So then I get asked the question, are there apostles today? Because in some circles of Christianity, some people carry that title, apostle so-and-so. And my answer would be, unless they've seen the resurrected Jesus and unless they can perform miracles, they are not, strictly speaking, an apostle. There are no apostles unless those things happen. So I don't want to say that it is impossible because Paul, after the fact, saw the resurrected Jesus. And he was also one who was able to perform miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. But aside from that, there are no apostles today. That said, the gifting of apostleship is still available in this sense that God still gifts certain people to have certain visions to launch churches or ministries and then hand them off. It's an apostolic kind of a gifting where the person doesn't have a long-term relationship with some ministry or some church, but they get it started and then they move along. And then the other gift here, that uh, one of the other four that uh, Paul mentions at the end of this 12th chapter is the gift of teaching. And it really doesn't need any more explanation other than the one I've given to you on the screen. Teaching is the inspired ability to communicate God's truth with clarity so that those in the church may learn and grow in their faith. Pretty self-explanatory. So the gift of teaching. Two more then that he mentions here also at the end of chapter 12. The gift of helps uh, in verse 28. And the gift of administration. In verse 28. So the gift of helps is the special ability to serve or assist others in practical, meaningful ways. This is basically a quiet ministry of helping people. Uh, People with the gift of helps don't have to be asked to do anything. They just see someone in need and they jump in. And it usually is behind the scenes. Someone with the gift of helps, usually behind the scenes, just helping people where there's a need. They seem to have a special eye and a heart for people in need, and they just help them without being asked. It's a wonderful gift, and it's very important in the body of Christ like all the other gifts. And then the gift of administration is the inspired ability to devise and execute plans and objectives within the body of Christ. Now, the Greek word here in, that's the original language of the New Testament, the Greek word for administration is the word kubernesis, kubernesis. Kubernetes actually translates a shipmaster or a captain. The literal meaning is to steer or to rule or govern. It carries the idea of someone who guides and directs a group of people toward a goal or destination. And with this gift, the Holy Spirit enables certain Christians to organize, direct, and implement plans. It is a task-oriented gifting that is concerned with details and organization. And we need people with the gift of administration uh, in the body of Christ. Now, I want to just quickly add, just for the sake of completing the list, okay, we're not going to turn there and have, you know, more Bible study on these particular gifts, but I do want to just give you the list of the others that are found between Romans 12, 6 and 8, and Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. In Romans 12, there's a a list of some gifts given. And again, when you eliminate the ones that have already been mentioned, you find from Romans 12, five new gifts between verses 6 and 8. And those gifts are serving, encouraging, giving, leadership, and mercy. 
Serving is similar to the gift of helps, only whereas the gift of helps is more people-oriented, the gift of serving is more task-oriented. It is rolling up your sleeves and doing things within the church because it just needs to get done. So it's more task-oriented than it is necessarily people-oriented, but it is seeing a need and doing the work. Encouraging is, you know, just as it sounds. It's coming alongside of someone and encouraging them because you see that they are discouraged. You just have a wonderful way of just speaking encouraging words or giving, you know, the right scripture verse. What does Proverbs say? A word aptly spoken is like apples of uh, gold and settings of silver. And, it, you know, just a wonderfully appropriate, encouraging word. Or maybe you come alongside of somebody and you just want to pray for them. And, and you have always that, that right thing to say for those who are discouraged. The gift of giving is, is, is a gift where um, you're able to manage your finances well. It doesn't necessarily mean you're wealthy. It could mean that. God gives people uh, wealth and, uh, and the ability to uh, make money. That's what Deuteronomy tells us. Uh, don't think it is of your own means that you've produced this wealth, but it is God who gives us the ability, okay? I'm not talking about get rich because God gets people rich, because if you become a Christian, you get rich. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying if you understand that the source of all that you own and all that you have come from above, then we want to be good stewards of it. And God gifts certain people to manage your finances well, whether you have a lot of it or a little of it, all of it comes from his hand, to be able to bless others and to just be generous, uh, and, and so that is a gift that God gives to some people. Leadership is another gift. It's the ability to lead and influence others, to direct them harmoniously. The gift of mercy is a wonderful gift. It's the ability to show empathy and compassion to people in distress, to be very merciful to people who are in need. You have also in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, two more gifts that are mentioned outside of the ones that are already repeated. You have the gift of evangelism and the gift of pastoring slash shepherding. It is a Greek word poema that can mean either to pastor or to shepherd. But evangelism is the ability to develop relationships with people and share the gospel with people in just a warm and genuine way. And you have a unique and just a natural way of leading people to Christ. So you might have that gift of evangelism Um, And then the gift of pastoring or shepherding is the gift to be able to nurture and care for the spiritual development of others. So that kind of rounds out the 20. You have 13 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Then you have seven more between this list out of Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. And so, you know, I trust that you might be able to identify the gifts that God has given you. And, you know, look, I also believe that as people grow and mature in their faith that God can choose to give you different gifts and new gifts. And so you may not identify certain ones right now that you may identify later. Let me read chapter 13. I don't know how far we're going to get into it tonight, but I'm going to read all of it, and then we'll come back and in the few minutes we have left, and we'll, we'll talk about this. This is a wonderful chapter. This is known as the love chapter of the Bible. Um, G. Campbell Morgan said that examining this chapter is like dissecting a flower to understand it. He said, if you tear it apart too much, you lose the beauty. So I don't want to tear it apart too much. I want it to just to kind of speak for itself. Alan Redpath said that one could get a spiritual suntan from the warmth of this chapter. And it is a warm chapter indeed. I'm going to read all of it. It's only 13 verses. Paul says, now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. 
Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. All right, now I'm going to save the bulk of my remarks for next Wednesday night's study, but I do want to at least say this much, because last week I kind of ended with an intentional cliffhanger, like, all right, so if tongues is not the, the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what is? And the answer is love. Because Paul actually takes some of the gifts of the Spirit here. You might have noticed them interspersed here in the first section. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, he talks about, if I have the gift of tongues, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, he also adds in verse 2, if I have a faith, the gift of faith that can move mountains. Verse 3, he says, if I give all I possess to the poor, if I have the gift of giving, all right, if I have all these various spiritual gifts, but if I have not love, I'm nothing. I'm only making noise. If I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only making noise. If I can fathom all these mysteries, if I give all I have to the poor, if I have all these great and wonderful spiritual gifts that God gives, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And all of this is meaningless. Because the real and ultimate thing that identifies someone as having been baptized by the Holy Spirit is not a particular gift, it is love. The reason why he sandwiches chapter 13 between 12 and 14, which talks about the list of the gifts, and then chapter 14 talks about the function of the gifts, primarily tongues and prophecy. The reason he sandwiches chapter 13 between the two is because he wants us to know that the glue related to the spiritual gifts is love. What did Jesus say at the Last Supper? After he washes his disciples' feet, he says to them, By this will all men know that you are my my disciples if you love one another. Not if you're speaking in tongues. Not if you have the gift of healing. Not if you can prophesy. He said, the thing that will distinguish the church as really belonging to me is if you have love. Is if you demonstrate genuine, true love. That is the evidence that you belong to me. And that is the evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So, do not be disheartened if you feel like you don't have a particular gift. The real measure of a man or a woman in terms of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You want to know, really, whether or not you've been filled with God's Spirit? The evidence is love. Now, I've got so much more to say about this, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Okay, So, we're going to dissect chapter 13 next Wednesday night, Lord willing... We're going to talk about it more in depth because it's an important chapter. I don't want to pull it apart too much. Like G. Campbell Morgan said, it's like a delicate flower, but there's some important stuff we need to see and we need to insert ourselves in this chapter. And I'll tell you what that's about next week, but let's pause there and pray. Father, we thank you for this time together tonight, looking into your word. We pray that you would use it to challenge and encourage us. And Father, we pray that we would look at ourselves and begin to identify the gifts that you've given us and be thankful, Lord, and that we might function and flourish in those particular gifts, that the body of Christ might be strengthened, that together, Lord, we would complement one another with the gifts that you've given us and that we would glorify you, the one who has given and distributed these gifts to us so liberally and so wonderfully. I thank you, Lord, for the diversity within our church. We pray for more diversity in the sense of the various gifts and the differences among us, Lord, that are good for the strengthening of the church, that together we might glorify you as one body, though different in parts, one body, one Lord, one faith. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Amen. What a great service as usual. 
Remember, don't forget to check out the links below. Thanks for tuning in.